Hi, and welcome to the second of our videos on protein synthesis. This video looks at the process of translation. If you don't have a handle on transcription, which is the first part of protein synthesis, you definitely wanna make sure you go back and watch that video before you watch this one. But assuming you're good to go, let's move on. The main question that we're answering in these videos is how does DNA function in cells? We've already addressed the means by which DNA copies itself, the process referred to as DNA replication. And now we're looking at the way in which the information in DNA is used to produce proteins, which is referred to as protein synthesis or gene expression. In this video, we're gonna focus on the genetic code, how the information is actually used by the cell. And then we're going to provide an overview of translation as a process with some final discussion on the life cycle of proteins inside of cells. Looking specifically at gene expression, this video is gonna deal with the second arrow in the process, which is known as translation. Translation happens at the ribosome in cells, and it's going to involve the three major types of RNA. Messenger RNA is the RNA that actually contains the amino acid sequence information. Transfer RNA are RNA molecules that are gonna bring specific amino acids to the ribosome. And the ribosome itself is a complex of some proteins and ribosomal RNA, which is the actual structural building blocks of the ribosome. Let's zoom out and look at how genes are expressed. The sequence information in DNA is first copied into RNA. Messenger RNA molecules are going to take that sequence information to the ribosome where it will be interpreted. It turns out that messenger RNAs are read in segments of three nucleotides, or what are referred to as codons. Each codon is going to code for a specific amino acid in the protein, and it's through the action of proteins that we get traits, with a nod to the environment, of course. This is the way that genetic information works to go from DNA through to the point of having traits in organisms. Let's take a look at the genetic code specifically and see how it works. What this graphic is showing is all the possible three nucleotide combinations that we can see in mRNA codons. There are four different RNA bases, A, U, C, and G, and they need to code for 20 different amino acids. Each codon is three bases in length. So how many unique codons can you have using the four bases? The answer is 64. There are 64 possible unique three nucleotide combinations that you can see in RNA, which is more than enough to give us at least one codon for each of the 20 amino acids that comprise proteins. The way that you read a chart like this is to start at the middle where you see the five prime and then move outward according to the bases that you have in the codon. So for instance, the codon UUU, if we follow it straight up, gives us phenylalanine as an amino acid, whereas the codon UCA gives us serine, or the codon CCG gives us proline. We can do this all we want through the entire wheel of possible combinations. There are some other features of the genetic code that we should be aware of as well. The genetic code is redundant. What this means is that there are many instances where more than one codon codes for the same amino acid but it's also unambiguous. And what we mean there is that each codon only codes for one specific thing. Finally, it's also punctuated. There's one start codon, which is AUG, and codes for the amino acid methionine. And there are three separate stop codons, which you can see on the chart. They're UAA, UAG, and UGA. This tells the ribosome where to start and stop translation when a transcript is fed into it. The ribosome is made out of two different subunits that assemble together during the process of translation. You can actually see the ribosomal RNA molecules in these images. During translation, the two subunits of the ribosome will come together around the mRNA transcript in order to allow for translation to occur. tRNA molecules look somewhat different. They're each made out of one continuous strand of RNA that base pairs with itself and forms a highly convoluted three-dimensional conformation. Here are two different tRNA molecules up close. We have our phenylalanine tRNA and our aspartate tRNA. They look very, very similar, but there are a couple of differences. The first is that they each bring different amino acids to the ribosome. I've circled them here in red, and you can see that they are in fact different structures up at the end of the ribosome. The second part that's different is what's called the anti-codon loop. This is a sequence of three nucleotides 
that is complementary to the sequence of any particular codon. If you go back to the codon chart and you look at the codons for phenylalanine and aspartate, you'll find codons that are complementary to the anticodon loop on each of these tRNA molecules. Since tRNA molecules need to bring amino acids to the ribosome and then drop them off, there is a need for a group of enzymes whose job is to put new amino acids onto tRNA molecules that no longer have them. These enzymes are known as amino acyl tRNA synthetases, and their entire job is to put a specific amino acid on a specific tRNA. This graphic shows you five different examples, and you can see that there's a wide variety in the structure of the amino acyl tRNA synthetases depending upon the structure of the amino acid that the particular enzyme is responsible for putting on or charging the tRNA molecule with. Let's look at the process of translation up close. There are three major steps to translation. The first step is the initiation step. The initiation step involves the ribosome forming around the mRNA transcript so that the first AUG codon in the transcript is in the appropriate place in the ribosome, what we refer to as the P site. After this initial assembly, all other incoming tRNAs are going to enter next door to the P site in the ribosome at what is called the A site. In this computer-generated graphic, you can see the P site and the A site regions of the ribosome and two different tRNA molecules occupying those two different regions. The mRNA transcript is shown in this graphic as an orange molecule below the two yellow tRNA molecules. During the elongation phase of translation, peptide bonds are going to form between the amino acid chain that's in the P site and the incoming amino acid that tRNA is bringing into the A site. Once that amino acid bond is formed, the peptide chain will then be held by the tRNA molecule that's in the A site. So the ribosome will then translocate or move so that the tRNA molecule that was in the A site is now in the P site, and there's now an open codon in the A site for the next tRNA molecule to bring in, form a peptide, translocate, and so on. This process will repeat for every amino acid that's called for by the mRNA transcript. You can see that happening in this computer-generated image. We have three different tRNA molecules. The P site tRNA molecule and the A site tRNA molecule are in the process of forming the peptide bond between their amino acids, which I have circled here in green. And we have an uncharged or empty tRNA molecule in the E site. This is a tRNA molecule that brought a specific amino acid to the ribosome earlier in the transcript. It's now going to leave the ribosome, which is why it's in the E or the exit site. Elongation is going to continue until we reach a stop codon. When the stop codon in the transcript is encountered, a tRNA molecule is not going to enter the ribosome. Instead, a protein referred to as a release factor, which is shown here in purple, is going to enter and bind to the stop codon at the A site. A peptide bond cannot be formed between the polypeptide chain and the release factor. So the polypeptide chain is going to be released from the ribosome and the ribosome is then going to disassemble. The two subunits are going to come apart, leaving the mRNA open either for additional translation or to be disassembled by the machinery in the cell. If you're keeping track of the different sites of the ribosome and how they're all functioning in this process, you can see them over here in the image. So what happens next to the protein? Well, it turns out that many proteins are able to form into their native conformations just as a function of being produced, but there are many more that aren't. So a lot of proteins are going to need further modifications in order to actually become their functionally mature selves. This is accomplished in a lot of different ways in cells, but one way in which it's accomplished is through the action of what are called chaperonin proteins. These proteins have large cavities that newly made polypeptide chains can enter into in which the conditions can be altered so that that polypeptide chain assembles into its functional conformation. Of course, various organelles in the endomembrane system can also serve roles in the production of proteins, particularly the endoplasmic reticulum and the Golgi body. And of course, nothing lasts forever. Old proteins need to be broken down into amino acids so that those amino acids can be reused by the cell to produce new proteins. One way this is accomplished is through the action of the protein ubiquitin, which attaches itself to old proteins and signals to structures like proteasomes inside of the cell that the protein needs to be broken down. Ubiquitin tagged proteins will enter into the proteasome where hydrolytic enzymes will break them apart into their constituent amino acids. Thanks so much for watching this video on translation. Make sure you can do the following things here at the end. Make sure that you can describe the role of mRNA, tRNA, and ribosomal or rRNA in translation. Make sure that you can explain the process of translation as it's discussed in this video. Make sure that you can interpret the genetic code. If you're given a sequence of RNA, can you use that to determine the amino acids that would be produced?
And make sure that you can transcribe and translate a protein coding gene, starting with the DNA and going all the way through to the amino acid sequence in the protein. If you can do all those things, you're doing great. If not, that's okay too. Take a moment and write down any questions that you have and then do what you need in order to get your answers to those questions. Thanks again for watching. I really appreciate it. Have a great day.